<laughs> so um, I was just in DC where I saw Marjan and one of our activists that is in the halls of Congress with us all the time, Ahmed, um, he's a, you know, works in business. I think he works in HR in a company. So, you know, hadn't been exposed to local peace economy at all. And when I got to him, it was the day after the GWU encampment had been closed down. And they had like done that, even an encampment outside of GW and that had been closed down. And you know, what he said to me was like, everything inside of me longs to be back in the encampment like longs to be inside of that peace economy that we experienced. And um, the same with the folks here in LA, everybody wants to make it again because they hadn't experienced that level of care and giving and sharing and creating that in the, you know, in a day you've got a library and you're feeding people and that we as humans self-organize to take care of each other and everybody finds the thing that they love to do and shows up and does it in a way that's relational. And we miss that in our lives. We miss that immediacy and that care and that discovery. I think, you know, I heard from a lot of people just discovering things that they never had a relationship to in their regular lives. And the meeting of people, the, the, the magic that was happening, the generosity that was happening. Some people, some of the young people were just like, I just can't believe the generosity that actually had them feeling their own value as a student, which probably doesn't happen a lot, but they were really like, oh my God, people are showing up for us. So you have like, you had the community showing up for the students and them taking everything and then creating with it. And it was just so beautiful. And, you know, now we see across the country that it was, um, you know, different Zionist organizations for, you know, paying for their mayor or the heads of the school or whatever to disrupt them violently, um, which will take quite a while for this story to come out. Um, but I think it's a, an important reminder that um, it is the peace economies that the United States continues to bomb and want to go to war on. And it is, um, there's something about people in power that just don't like people who value peace and understand peace and create peace. So um, it's always a good thing to remember, you know, at Code Pink, we say the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. Um, so that we remember um, when people are upset, not to be upset at them because they're just learning and it takes a while and it's a little painful at the beginning. Um, just as we know from, you know, our pivoting ourselves off the war economy and the peace economy, it keeps kicking us in the ass and we keep doing the same thing over again. And was like, oh my God, that was transactional or, oh my God, how, you know, how tight can I be? Or like, why wasn't I just, you know, like we're every day, I think if you're really in the practice, you're being reminded how deep those practices go inside of us. So welcome, lovely to see everyone. Um, today we're gonna talk about community. I'm Jody Evans, I'm the co-founder of Code Pink and... And I'm Emily Franco, I'm the local peace economy coordinator at Code Pink. Welcome everyone, good to see you all. Um, and yeah, please um, introduce yourself in the chat and share anything, um, what, maybe what brought you here, where you're calling in from. And with that too, um, I'm going to introduce a new a new thing this week called Padlet, which is a way to see um, where everyone is visually. Um, new Economy Coalition, if any of you are familiar with them, use this on a call, and I thought it was super cool. So I just put the link in the chat, and I will share my screen for a moment. I can show you how to use it. Um, just okay. So this is uh, Padlet, and as you can see, there's only one entry on this map right now, and it's me, and I'm in Denver, um, as I'm scrolling out here. But you can put it anywhere in the world, and how you add yourself is you go to the bottom right-hand corner here, hit Add Post, Search and search the name of your place. For example, like I searched my hometown and which is a smaller town and it came up. 
but now I would do Denver, select, select it. And then um, just like write maybe who you are and um, anything you want to share about yourself. Um, I, you know, in my post, I put that I'm a local peace economy coordinator, Code Pink, I'm excited to be supporting people cultivating local peace economies. Um, anything you want to share, you can go back and edit it as well. And um, this is a great way to just kind of like see who is where since we're talking about local and this will continue to compile for each call. Um, and so that way it's a great way to find out if there's people near you too um, who are connected to this work. So does anyone have any questions about that? People able to access it? Okay. So yeah, feel free to add yourself as we're introducing. And I'm just going to do announcements now since there's a few and we're always running up against time. Um, and I'll just put them in the chat. Just pull it out. So to register for the next call, which will be on June 5th, um, there's the link there. If you have um, local peace economy ideas that you want to um, kind of cultivate in your community, but you're not really sure how to start or would like some su support, feel free to email me to set up a time to talk with me or me and Jody. Um, and we're happy to support you and kind of like think through that and um, see if we like what we know about your area, um, who we can connect you with. Always here to support you. We have a local peace economy listserv. Um, so that link there is to join the listserv, and that's a way to stay connected between calls. Um, there's something that Code Pink is doing called the Summer School for Gaza. Um, on June 17th, it will be about the local peace economy. So that link there is to sign up for that. So I'm going to let you know if that's coming up. And then I wrote a, a Pink Tank article or blog post article recently about um, about the war economy and the peace economy and the roots of the word war and how I what I learned about that recently and the thoughts that inspired in me. So I wanted to share that as well because it does talk about what the peace economy. Um, yeah, and with that, and Jody is going to be a little bit in and out tonight. Um, just a heads up there. So I'll kind of be facilitating. So now that we've gotten all the logistics out of the way, um, we'll ground as we as we normally do. Um, I'm gonna sh share a poem after we take a breath, but just a warning, the poem does contain a little bit of spicy language. Um, so if there are children in the room, if you wanna mute um, for a minute, in case that's of concern, just wanted to give you a heads up, or if that's something that you don't wanna hear. So I'm just gonna take a breath. And this poem is called Dear Mothership. And it's by a poet named Marcus Wicker. He's a Black poet who was born and raised in Michigan. Earth is reeking. And we obsidian-backed, winged, cling to the funk in a language that never fails. Peace vibes. Wonderment and all that pimp shit. An ambrosia we invent to savor roses through the stink. Like witch grass effacing a wheat bed with a gangster lean. Bias paralyzes their country, white flame searing through red and blue cells. Branded into whosoever drinks. America, the perforated straw in a single fold. Stop creasing my visage with grief. If only in the beginning someone said, I wish us the sun and everything under it. Perhaps then we'd survive by friendship, happiness, justice, love. Say, Together, we can do the necessary. If only from the jump, fled everyone at the house party. Mothership, teach me how to be neighborly, how to gather light in, then release. Mother, please teach me how to be human. And that poem will be linked in the, um, in the follow-up email that I'll put if you wanna learn more about the poet, Marcus Wicker. There's a chat for you. And Jody um, reflected this back to me today, but um, I want to bring it to the group in terms of I'm curious when you're in meetings or in other gathering spaces, 
how you are inviting in presence and grounding um, with a poem, with a meditation, with an embodiment exercise, with a collective breath, and how you see that shaping what's possible um, in that space together. Um, so if you would love to, sh if you want to share anything about that, or just share, as we often open with, um, what you've been learning, what's been up for you, as I like to say, in the last two weeks since we've been meeting. Um, and if you're new here, um, just what brought you here. Anything you want to share about what you're learning on your local peace economy journey will open up the space now. What questions you have? What what questions you have about community? Does that maybe we can speak to them too? And we can go into those in the breakout. So maybe we should just start with our guests. Okay, okay great. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to duck out. I'm I'm double dipping to tonight. Um. Uh, we, we also have a call about the DNC and the RNC, so I had to give them a, a little pep talk about joining us in case anybody wants to be in Chicago or um, Milwaukee this summer. <laughs> so I want to introduce Calandra Davis, who has been part of our journey in creating the workbook. And, you know, the reason that I brought Calandra on the team was that she is someone who from her community had been educated to serve the war economy. And, you know, she was in it for a little while and went, wait, this is not good for me, my children um, and the future of the world. So uh, I loved that she had pulled herself out of the machine and was really dedicated to community. And so she's here to talk to us tonight about cultivating community, which she does both locally um, in a, a big city where she is and a, and a small town. So she has experience in both and she's the mom of uh, three um, children that uh, I can see one of them on the screen. So uh, Calandra, welcome. Thank you for joining us and um, looking forward to hearing from you. All right, hi everyone. Um, and don't worry, I'm not driving, I'm, but I am in the car. Um, and as usual, I'm multitasking. So just, you know, ignore me. And I, I've been told that it's really informal. Um, so, you know, if I get interrupted um, or if you want me to stop or whatever, just let me know. Um, as Jody mentioned, I, I don't know if she, I'm, I'm in Mississippi. I live in um, Jackson, Mississippi uh, with my partner and my children, we have strategically decided to live in West Jackson. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but um, it's basically the blackest and poorest part of Jackson, Mississippi. And Jackson is already one of the blackest and poorest cities in the state, although it's the capital. Um, but we could go into the reasons why for that on another call. I also am back and forth through um to a place called Port Gibson, Mississippi. And so, and it's really right outside, it's like a township right outside of Port Gibson. It's a rural part of Port Gibson, um, where we have been organizing there as well. And so when I talk about community, because we all could mean we it could mean so many different things for so many different people. Sometimes we say things like we have community based on the issues that you know we care about or we have community based on our our um career or all of that but I specifically am talking about my geographic community um and I I do that because I am I do something or I practice something called bottom-up organizing that has been around and was introduced um, at least to me, through an elder who was under Ella Baker and in the SNCC movement. And so when I talk about community, I'm talking about, like, we don't all have the same mindset. Um, it's because it's, it's my neighbors. It's those who are around me in both areas, in rural Mississippi and in West Jackson. Um, let's see. As Jody mentioned, I was in the war economy. I, I mean, I'm still figuring my way through the war economy as I, I guess many of us are um, and divesting from the war economy. I And a lot of times, I, again, when we say war economy, that might look very different for people. 
for me, I didn't even realize I was in the war economy because I was doing quote unquote good work. I went to school, got a master's in public service. I was doing and still do some policy advocacy work. I try to make sure good legislation is passed, bad leg leg legislation um, doesn't pass. Um, but what I've learned, and I I, I said uh, I have a quick little note, so I hope y'all can still see me, that what I've learned, and specifically what I learned due to an uh, instance in West Jackson is that um, all existing legal, political systems, institutions, they are currently mechanisms of um, colonization, oppression, and they help to perpetuate that. And so even when we move the needle just a little, those systems are also moving the needle. Um, and so a lot of the work, although good work, not even necessarily bad work, even the charity work, you know, it just wasn't really, get, in my, at some point I realized, oh, this isn't doing it for me. Like, we aren't getting anywhere. I'm spending so much of my energy, my time, labor. At that time, I only had one child. Um, I, I was going to city council meetings. I was testifying. And um, I was talking to people who were like not in my community, but who were making all the decisions for the community that I lived in. And it just didn't feel right. I was helping a lot of organizations who were on the ground. Um, in 2021, Jackson had a, Jackson has an ongoing water crisis even now, but 2021, an ice storm happened, which is doesn't really happen in Mississippi. And so a lot of us, including myself, we were without water completely for like two weeks. And so um, a lot of water bottles were being passed out. And that was basically it. Like there was no real, we a lot of conversation was happening with on the state level, the local level, the federal level of what can we do to help people get water. Um, but it just felt like it was falling on deaf ears. And again, a lot of time and labor was going into this, but it didn't seem like the actual people who were impacted were get were, had a lot of voice in it, in my opinion. Um, and so I was pretty much done. I had been organizing as what I thought was organizing. And I was just like, I'm tired of this, I'm done. Um, I met my partner. I'm trying to give a very short version of this. And we and I started learning more about like bottom up organizing and sustainability and local peace economies, which we didn't use that term. Um, but it was I later learned that, oh, this is what we're doing. We have a, we're building a local peace economy. We're creating a local peace economy with our neighbors because we want to use consensus based decision making. We're not doing something for our neighbors. We're working with each other to create something. Um, one of the biggest things that I have learned in these last few years is that shared space and community are two very different things. And so I, um, even recently, we had a plot of land that we had, we thought, you know, we were just very happy with like, we've talked to the neighbors about this plot of land. We are going to all own it collectively. And, um, we are going to decide what we want to do with it. We're going to grow some food. We're going to have some some place, some areas for the children. We're going to do all these different things. Um, and it was working well for like two years. Um, but somewhere in there, we forgot to pay the taxes. Um, and someone in our community, in our shared space, um, they actually bought the land. And then they were like, we don't want anyone else coming on it. And so what I've learned, and I, I believe this is in one of the pivots to peace, is that individualism, if we're not careful, will be the depth of us. Um, and people, and you know, I, I can't even really be mad at the person because they are a neighbor. When we got contacted about the plot of land, um, oh. I... I was like, oh, that so, so someone contacted us. They told us that, hey, we don't want you on the land anymore. And we was like, well, is it an, like an outside investor? Um, like, who is this group that's come in? When we found out it was our neighbor, I'm not going to lie, I was a little hurt. Because I was like, yo, we've been having conversation. What's going on? Um, but this has, and this has happened like twice to me. And I think we're just at a time where people are trying to look out for themselves 
They're trying to do whatever they can. They want to, and they're doing it in a very individualistic way. Um, and if we could at all, in some way pivot from individualism to collectivism, to community, that would be great. Um, I think there's more work to be done there. I, I'm working with my neighbors, my partner, other organizers where I live to figure out what that actually looks like. Um, because I, I I feel like, you know, we must have missed a step or something there. Um, so that's the one thing that has shown up for me um, as I talk about community that we still really have to tackle the individualism within the community, within the spaces that we share so that we can actually have community. Um, some of the things that I think about what makes a, what pivots a shared space into an actually a actual community is I, I mentioned consensus-based decision-making. So where we have agreement, when we have agreements and we can move on those agreements, um, that really helps to us to have at least a foundation when we have principles that we all agree on that we want to live by, that really helps. Um, and there's a lot, honestly, that is going on so much, at least in the community that I live in. It's like every day we got something happening. Uh, we have children at our house because they haven't eaten and we like, we can't feed the whole community. Like that's not gonna be, help. that's not sustainable. So how do we do this together? How do, how can one neighbor help us with the garden and the next neighbor help with childcare? Um, and it's a slow process because Again, we're not trying to do anything for someone. We're trying to do things with people, which means that we want to build relationship. And so we are building relationship. And that takes time because it's not just a transactional conversation like, hey, can you build a garden and I give you this? It's, it's actually deeper than that. Like, I, I want to know your name. I want to know your children's name. Like, you're dead. my neighbors come, they hold my babies, they clean my house. I do vice versa. We We just have relationship and so a lot of what we do doesn't really look like anything to the you know to the outside eye because it's like these are just neighbors but we actually have something going on so we a lot of us in my community we haven't knocked on every door so we we have a 10 block radius and but that we strategically have said this is the community because we we can't do all of Mississippi with just a few we have. So in that 10 block radius, that's what we want to organize. And on the amount of doors that we've knocked on, the conversations we've had, the relationships we built, um, a lot of us are saying that we don't, we want to create our own. We don't really want to have to lean on and to depend on the system. And so in some organic way, we've like created security and defense. We've created ways where someone has gotten shot we've learned how to protect that per we've learned how to like help that person we've learned how to de-escalate and to mediate um so that someone else doesn't like retaliate and so it's like my partner says we're really in the trenches and we don't think about it that way all the time but like that we're doing the the hard work some that it's also joyful work because we also have birthday parties and we get together and drink wine and do all these many different things, but it's real work. Um, I can't remember. It was some other. Oh, and I, okay. And so the last, I guess I'll end with this. The And I think that's the most joyful part for me around creating and cultivating community. Um, it takes time. It takes patience. It takes, you know, intentionality, but with all of that, at the end, every day I'm going to laugh. Like every day I'm going to have a neighbor that's going to reach out to me. It feels good that my neighbors will call me or my partner and say, hey, we just want to let y'all know what's going on. Or, hey, we heard that something was happening over here. Can we help out with this? And so um, though I have had moments where I felt discouraged because individualism shows up or because uh, you know some reactionary moments show up or transactional moments show up 
I have way more moments where I'm feeling the opposite or I'm feeling um, peaceful. I'm feeling joyful. I'm feeling um, love because I, I actually see like a shift happening, um, not just with my neighbors, but with myself, with my own children. I see my nine-year-old who typically would like a we very individualistic or say she may like we had an incident with my nine-year-old where she was talking about someone's shoes because you know consumerism and capitalism and she's just like oh look his shoes aren't Jordans blah 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 um and then that same person that she was talking about ended up becoming like one of her really great friends because they're our neighbor and she got a better understanding of just what it means to value things that are not material, what it means to actually value the friendship and how that our value isn't tied to the material, that this person is actually a joyful, fun, great person and is not tied to like the value of his shoes. Um, so hopefully I hit on everything, Emily and Jody. Um, if not, of course, you know, ask questions but yeah that's just a little bit of who I am and what I do in Mississippi you are a rock star thank you so much Calandra because it's just like so real it's you're doing the work and um and it's messy and that's part of what we forget about community is it's messy but it's joyful and it's full of magic every day it's just like it's surprising and I love the part where you say and it makes you laugh you know every day there's that you can, in community, you can get down to not being against each other, but finding the joy in each other. So um, before Calandra goes to take care of her three kids, is there any questions anyone has for Calandra? If you wanna raise your hand or any questions before we move on? Looks like we're good. Thank you, Calandra. And make sure you let us know where we can send some books to folks in your community. Yes, of course. Thank you. Talk to everyone. Thank, thank you so Thanks, much. <laughs> All right. So uh, there we go. There's community with the, the beauties and the struggles. And, and you know, Calandra has a choice. She could have stayed, you know, in one world and she really saw the devastation of it and made the other choice. So, you know, I think we're seeing that a lot with young people right now. Um, that are looking for, and I hope this summer, we can come up with some wonderful ways to be nourishing that and being and helping that. So um, we'd like to break into um, our breakouts with the question you share with each other, which is, where have you created community? What have you learned from it? What have been, you know, what have been the trials? What have been the successes? And maybe what you're afraid of um, when you you go to think about creating community. So um, that, uh, I think Emily will post it in the chat. And um, let's see, um, we've got, um, let's see, 12. Um, I'm gonna do four rooms. Uh, should be three or two to three in a room, and um, you know, share with each other about community um, and your relationship with it. And we'll be back in about fifteen. And also, I would add one question: is like, what support do you need in creating community? And maybe we can share some wisdom. Yeah. All right. See you back. Um, hey, hey, coming back to the big room with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> we love to hear that. <laughs> hey, Andy, I hear they all complain. Welcome back, everyone. Is it, does everyone do it? Or are we missing one of you still? Um, Hmm, I think we lost a few people because everybody's back. Um, okay. Uh, we're missing one. 
Okay. So, uh, whoops, you're sharing your screen and not the Zoom. Emily? Um, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> um, Can you unshare your screen? Yeah. <laughs> Oh no, this is just, this is just me sharing their screen? Yeah. It says you're sharing your screen. It says I'm sharing my screen? <laughs> I don't know. Because it's, mine says just me. Are you on the call still? Um, okay, it looks like they stopped. Okay, okay. okay cool. We fixed it. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> I was rolling with all the tech stuff. Cool. Okay, so we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you learned, what you shared, what you're thinking, what you need. Uh, since community is the core of this work, what what can we do to help you? Um, yeah, all of the above. I think... Um, Marjorie. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it's... My community used to be my workplace, um, although in the community that I lived in, I also had friends and and um, groups that I interacted with. Um, when I retired, I, I moved um, up to Massachusetts from New York, and uh, we have a small community. We have, um, I live in an apartment complex, and the building that I'm in has has um, a mix of elders, um, parents with children, um, couples who are who are together, and all that. So, I mean, a lot of people work, but we have we have a little band of of elders here that keep in touch and offer whatever we can um, to each other to help with whether it's a medical appointment or um, if I'm out doing grocery shopping and, and, and one of my friend calls and says, can you get me some half and half? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so one of the things at the encampments was the intergenerational nature of them. And I'm wondering what it would take to make this more in intergenerational um, because that's where the good stuff happens um, in the intergenerationality of it. it it's where the more surprises can happen. Um, uh, I think, um, um, you know, I'm I'm just thinking back to being in the encampments and, you know, everyone at every different age has a different kind of wisdom to share because it's immediate. You know, we forget quickly what it is to be wherever we were. But, um, oh, I know, you know, uh, it was being in the halls of Congress around Mother's Day and we had the thousand grandmothers. And really being in the grandmother wisdom that was so appreciated by the young mothers um, and that it's so different than what they have to offer or even what they have access to because, you know, we forget when you're mothering your child, it is narrow. It does narrow your focus. And I feel like for my grandmother, like the hormones that when they kicked in, it was just like the narrow focus melted into a global focus, into a sense of responsibility for the all, a sense of responsibility for the bigger community, whether it was the bigger community around me or you know the whole planet or that you, because your the need to raise a child is gone, there's something else you're free to do that has a, a you know, has a lens that isn't accessible to everyone. And I don't, I only know about grandmother energy. So like, you know, if somebody else wants to talk to about grandfather energy, um, if that same hormonal rebalance happens. Um, but I I have witnessed it in also the same in, in grandfathers in that sense of, um, uh, 
um, a bigger care, you know, of, of also, I, I think for the grandfathers, it's going from having to take care of the family and deliver the, you know, make sure all the needs are met to recognizing what the needs of the bigger community are. And even for the lucky ones who haven't just been worn down by it and then therefore enslaved by it, those that really see um, the devastation of, mm -hmm. I, I see at a time when um, men are starting to see like the cost of it or the prices that they've paid. I'm working with, uh, funny enough, um, a, a, a bunch of billionaires found local peace economy and loved the managing complexity part because they've been problem solvers and they realized all their problem solving had created more problems than it solved. And now they feel really bad and they have all this money, but they also know philanthropy is worse than capitalism. So they feel like stuck in how do I do anything that isn't making something worse? They're, you know, kind of in that space. And, um, that comes out of like recognizing, whoa, this system that I was part of is devastating. You know, it's it's even as Calandra was saying, it's like, I'm doing good, but I'm not really doing good. I'm just being used by it. And I think they're having the same thing. I'm just being used by it. So they figured out the seven catastrophes, they call it the seven crises, that are hovering over the world and they're working on those at a major level. Um, not solving any problems, but trying to understand the complexity of them and where you, you could throw some uh, rocks in the way to slow them down. <laughs> um, you know, AI probably is one of the biggest ones they've picked on, but um, PFAS is another one which we work on from you know the military PFAS it could pink, but um, you know I've I've learned from them uh, that you know the devastation to the oceans to all the water to what's in our bodies with PFAS that continue to be manufactured even though we know the devastating that they you can't they live forever and they cause death and cancer and so it's funny that you know we we learned these things about some things in the past that we were able to change but these are more damaging and we're still not able to stop the production of them. Or, you know, one of the things they've decided to commit themselves to is um, buying up land that can be turned into bio, you know, protected biodiversity because that will extend the life of the planet. Um, and so they've now saved 50 million acres into biodiversity. And so that doesn't, cause a problem, you know, it's like, what can I do that doesn't cause a problem? What can I do that's positive? So taking land out of being destroyed that also serves um, the indigenous communities that live near it has been another focus. So, um, you know, that's, they have a lot of money, they have to figure out how to do that. But it's like, as we all are, it's like, how do we be in relationship with our community? And, um, I think intergenerationality is huge. And I think from seeing what was happening in the encampments, I, I found it to be part of what the richness of those communities was. So Marjorie, that's just to say, what would you, could you write a note to everybody else in your building and say, join us to hear more about the local peace economy and how we can be more intertwined as a community here in this building and see what happens. Yeah, sure. Maybe they need to feel community given where they are in their lives. Thank you. Anybody else have something come up? Okay. So I uh, wound up in uh, in a room with um, Marjan Chalal. Yeah. Uh, who's from Iran. Yes. And I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Oh, wow. And so we talked a lot about the co automatic community that that you get in an in the Arab world. Yeah, that's really kind of what we we talked about our experiences and how different it is here and how you just don't get that. And she also asked me to tell you that she had another call 
at yeah. eight forty five that she had to go on. So cool. that's why she's gone. Well, I'm anyway. glad you got paired out. That's part of the magic of community of who you break out and get to know. But but Joy, that's an important point, and it's why I say the U.S. is always bombing the local peace economies. Well. The Middle East is a local peace economy at the core. I mean, Palestinians, that's a local peace economy, you know, um, certainly in, you know, uh, even in Iran, funny enough, there's not really capitalism, you know, where it's working to become a monopoly and suck all the money out and and for make the few rich that even in Iran, um, it doesn't really have capitalism. It has a market economy. But like everybody's participating in the market economy, not to get rich, not to become a millionaire, but to take care of themselves and their community. And their and, community. Yeah. yeah. And it still has, you know, that huge amount of generosity, like wherever you show up, like, you know, recently when I went, like the United States has been starving, the, has basically starved the middle class out yeah. in Iran. And no matter where you go, still everybody invites you in for food and tea. Mm -hmm. Um and they have nothing, way, way less than you have. Um, and they've been, they're being crushed, um, you know, no fault of their own. It's it's another one where we're crushing the innocent. Um, and that's true with Iraq, that's true with Afghanistan, that's true with Iran, that's true with uh, Lebanon. You know, it's like, they're not cultures like the US that's run on capitalism, it's run on a market economy, where inside of that, the commitment is to the community. Mm -hmm. And um, it's even interesting because as you look at, I get films from Gaza and every day, you know, even in the face of this madness, everybody is working together to make each other happy. Everybody is working in community. It is the muscle. And it's why we created the workbook that, you know, what Calandra said is if we have the practice of not individualism, if we have the practice of caring for each other, that when the really bad stuff happens, it will be easier on us. You know, and I, you know, I say that about like Ashland, Oregon and Asheville, North Carolina, that in 2008, people didn't get fired and they didn't get kicked out of their houses why? Because it was a small local peace economy that um, you knew the banker, you knew the person, the people that you worked with, and they all figured it out together how you didn't get fired, how some people would take a cut. But because human beings are inherently generous. Um, and so we we get sold another story by the war economy so that we live in fear and we separate and we, you know, create all the, you know, kind of like calendrous generosity to the person who still lives in the war economy, thinks small and therefore doesn't serve the community. That, that she can come to that place is to understand that we're victims of the structure and not necessarily prone to be that way. Um, so I would say it's the same thing in Asia as in the Middle East, way more peace economy. Um, you know, Confucianism is about a peace economy, about caring for the whole, about the caring for the earth and caring for the community and caring for the family and then caring for yourself, you know, because there'll be so many people to care for you. You don't have to be self-oriented. Um, but we have to practice our way back there. Shit's happening. Um, you know, right now we are watching, when people say you should be afraid of Trump, I'm like, we're living in fascism. Yeah. You know, like, that is like what? <laughs> yeah. uh, the next person that says, you know, like they, they, they want you to pay attention to this little battle up here while you're, you know, everything's being taken out from underneath you. Um, it used to be the wars. Now it's just the battle of the, the Biden Trump, which limits anyone's thinking. And where I say, they're just trying to hook you into that and I say, just go build community. Don't think about it. You'll know who to vote for, but build community. No matter what happens, we need community. We need to be connected. We need good habits. Um, so sorry, I'm talking too much. Who else wanted to share? I'll, I'll jump in with a few thoughts. There's so much rich conversation here, but I think uh, one thing in our group uh, we were talking about uh, that uh, looking at like Palestine and then indigenous uh, cultures, in America, both, you know, have lived with the intergenerational cultural oppression and genocide and just like tough human uh, 
problems outwardly, but yet this uh, peace economy, as we're calling it, or sort of this care for the community, for caring for each other, seems to be flourishing more than in the outer world uh, war economy that we live in. So like, why is that? And it has something to do with, I think, uh, when we face adversity, there's something that wells up in the human being in terms of spiritual development and growth in, in the adults and, and the elders, especially, you know, who have lived through so much and they, they're still finding a way to be loving and caring to each other. So my vote here is like to really, as well as all our advocacy and policy changes and, and encampments and everything is like, as the more we age, I mean, young people too, but the, as we go through life to always keep nurturing and blossoming our our inner our being, our inner work is as important as our work in the world. And I think that's what comes with the community, the, the take the word apart, my teacher says it's community, come together. And in order to come together, we need to really see some of those basic teachings like uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Like Jesus wasn't kidding. There, that's the, the veil of separation is parted and we really understand that we are that closely interconnected. What mm -hmm. happens to my neighbor is happening to me, you know? So in, in, in small town, Wisconsin, we're seeing more of these little signs that are beautiful. We all do better when we all do better. Mm -hmm. that's, that. Yes, so beautiful. Thank you, Tom, that's so beautiful. And, and yeah, the, you know, but the other thing is, is the community helps us do the inner work. Um, I would say, you know, when we're watching what's happening in Israel, it's happening because there's an impunity. You know, I think the New York Times did an amazing piece on that this weekend, that when you have impunity, so if you have a community that can lovingly hold a mirror for you to see your violent behavior, to, to notice that you're upset, to notice your PTSD, to be able to support you so you don't become a crazy murdering maniac like um, those people that are running um, Israel right now. You know, they have just been, you know, if you keep allowing people mm -hmm. to be violent, they will keep being violent because they can't even be with themselves, you know? So um, I think too, community mm -hmm. helps our inner work. I just mm -hmm. want to add in one thing about uh, that, what point you're making, Jody, and that is, Yes, important to hold the mirror up, but so important to do it nonviolently. Yes. Have to, that, that the nonviolence is what makes it, that's like polishes the mirror. That's, oh, I see now. Otherwise, you're just like the, you know, the noisy, angry opposition who you can be labeled as such and, and discounted, you know? So I would just like real super emphasis on nonviolence. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh so um, I don't know, uh, I, I do think that that Michelle Alexander piece is awesome. Thank you, Sandy. And I just had, uh, um, um, <laughs> what's her name, Valerie Carr, just had me over to make, uh, as a community gesture, she lives down the street, just made a chocolate, a cacao ceremony for me, um, who also has the revolution of love. And we partner the revolution of love with the, cultivating a local peace economy. So yes, the revolution of love. Thank you, Sandy. And what what did you want to share? I would, just wanted to call people's attention to that article. I heard uh, Michelle Alexander speak on uh, Democracy Now! maybe three or four months ago. Pretty dynamic. And uh, I highly re recommend that article. Another uh, yes. thing, just something you, said, jo something you said, Jody, just a second ago reminded me of a movie I saw a while back that I didn't think I'd like very well, but I ended up liking it quite well. And it's called Occupy Love. Uh, check it out. Okay. Okay, what's it on? Oh, I don't know. It was uh, just a documentary, but a pretty creative mood movie. And my favorite character of people who were um, interviewed in that um, was a kid about 12 years old. Okay. It was Thank pretty you. powerful. Thank you. Yeah, Occupy, we're gonna need to do a lot of occupying. <laughs> all right, well, I uh, love you all. Um, see you in two weeks. And then I think Emily shared, but then we're gonna do it. It's our summer of love for Gaza at Code Pink. And the first one we will be talking and it's all about community. So mm -hmm. it's going to be taking everyone to engage in their community. The first one will be 
like how do we do that? How do you build community and and how do you engage? And um, it'll be about like maybe occupations outside of a member of Congress's house or, you know, encircling the APAC office or, you know, things like that, always disarming and peaceful. And uh, the second one is going to be about creating resistance through cultivating your local community. And so that will be uh, Emily and my week. And we hope you will all join that one. Um, but the summer it, Code Pink is about engaging locally and uh, both engaging to create care and love and support and engaging to take that into whatever, getting your city council to pay attention, you know, getting your member of Congress to pay attention. But we're not just so that we don't go away. The encampments aren't over. We are growing. Um, the movement has never been bigger. I'm on my way to Detroit where we have over 2,500 people signed up to our um Palestine conference. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, uh, it's growing. It matters. Um, you know, this is what impunity, this is where we show up and call on people for responsibility and no impunity, and that we just don't let go. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, they're taking everything they have and throwing at us. The arrests in, in the in the halls of Congress are getting brutal. Nobody's yeah. doing anything. They're getting arrested. They had to spend the night last night. Oh, wow. You know, they cut Anne's arm arresting somebody oh, just the day before. So uh, just know we're making a difference, y'all. We're making a difference. Love and peace are not, don't make people who are warmongers happy, but it is making a difference. Our community is growing globally. It is. Germany just joined with the ICC calling for the arrest of Netanyahu. Okay, good. I mean, funny, you know, amazing things are going to start happening. Yep. Funny yep. things like people you thought were lost are going to be found. Mm -hmm. That's why you need to take care of everybody. Like Tom said, it always just needs to be cared. They're just lost. And we're all here to help each other find their way back. So thank you. See you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for all you do. And make sure you thank reach you. out to Emily if you need any support. Yeah. Right. Good job whatever you need. It's good yeah. to see you all. Take good care. Okay. Good night all. Night. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Emily, you got the chat? Yes. I've got it several times. So okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you could just forward me the recording uh when you when you get a chance, that'd be great. So I can upload it tomorrow. Cool. Okay. Bye Joanne. Bye bye. <laughs> I, I, bye if you bye, can Anne. hang on what? It, if you can hang on a second. Yeah. Um, years ago, I did a, I did a media, uh, educational media class. And I found this quote that I used for the poster that I made. And it was from uh, an unknown elder um, in an Aboriginal or in a Native American tribe, probably in the Midwest. And it didn't say her name or what tribe or anything, but it was in a National Geographic. And she said, we are here to help each other and to make each other happy. <laughs> and I, at the time, I was young and I thought, well, that's kind of simple and, you know, <laughs> not very, <laughs> not very uh, astute, but <laughs> in fact, that's it yeah and so this conversation reminded me of that and I wish I had shared it earlier um well you know what Emily will include it in the in the notes for the meeting but thank uh, you she'll she'll include that uh, yes as we get older we realize it really is simple uh, it's kind of like those billionaires it's like whoa we thought we knew what we were doing we were just making a freaking mess <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, who's the writer that says it's it's all about kindness? Um, there's a really famous author. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, it doesn't. I can't find it. But yeah, is there? Is that connected to like the? A story about them on a bus. Is that what you're thinking of? 
No, no, there's, there's a famous author that always ends his novels with, you know, it's all about kindness. Oh, okay. But, um, he has something else. Uh, no, I'll try to find it. I mean, also Leo Tolstoy uh, was, you know, it's all about kindness. So um, <laughs> it goes back. <laughs> and we think it's way more complicated. All the right. The truth is much more simple than we think. No, I think that's so simple. <laughs> 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 the truth. 